today's episode, we open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 39. Today's chapter brings us the creation and adornment of the vestments to be worn by the priests of Israel when serving in the tabernacle. We start with the crafting of the ephod worn by the high priest and hear about the making of the breastplate adorned with precious stones, and then the completion of all the vestments, which were worn as a sign of the priest's consecration to God's service. Good morning and blessed Epiphany Tide. Today is Wednesday, January 18th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word. Each weekday morning, we gather here to explore the Holy Scriptures to which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is brought to you by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Go online and learn more about their translating and publishing work at lhfmissions.org. Also, please help us spread the word by telling your friends about Thy Strong Word. They can listen over the air, online at kfuo.org, or through any podcasting app. This morning, though, I'm pleased to welcome my guest, the Reverend Ryan Fairman, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Wausau, Wisconsin. Good morning, Pastor. Welcome back to the program. How are things for you in Wisconsin? Uh, A little bit snowy, but otherwise pretty great. So it's all good. That's wonderful. Yeah, we're supposed to get a little bit more snow today over here in Minnesota, southwest Minnesota. I think maybe Iowa's going to get it more than we are. I'm not sure if it's going to sneak up your way or not, but if you're anything like us, you already have plenty of snow that you have to deal with. We do, and and you're going to send us some of your snow, I'm pretty sure, tonight. So we'll see that <laughs> You too. can have it. <laughs> you can have it. I tell you what, we're, we're about sick of it. Our last little storm brought us about 20 inches of snow, and so it's just piled up here. And it's to the point where I don't even know if the kids are excited about snow anymore, uh, except for the possibility of maybe getting out of school a little early. I have a nice big window in the parsonage, and I like to look out over the field across from me and just whatever the weather is, I can enjoy that with a cup of tea and a good book. But to go outside, not so much. No, I agree with you there. Well, uh, anything else uh, going on at all that uh, you want to share with the listeners at your congregation or or things kind of slowed down for this epiphany season? It's that time of year in many congregations where things just slow down a little bit. Uh, we're deconstructing the church, so we're putting in new carpet, putting in new kitchen, things like that. Good time of year okay. to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's always nice. Uh, I'm sure that everybody is completely on board with the color of the carpet and how you're putting things all back together. There's been hopefully no conflict. Everything's being done to the glory of the Lord, I- I'm sure. Certainly to the glory of the Lord, and uh, I try to stay out of (laughs) color issues, definitely. Right. Well, it's funny because today we're going to talk a lot about color issues, but unfortunately for you and for any of us who've gone through church construction projects, God doesn't come down and give us an explicit description of exactly how we should put things together, so it's left up to our sanctified common sense, and sometimes we disagree. But in our text today— God is very clear about what he wants. They're putting it together, the vestments, at least in our case this morning, and uh, and we're going to find that Moses is going to check these over to make sure they're done properly. Uh, Before we dive into that text, though, uh, would you please start us off with some prayer? Certainly. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you that we can set aside and consecrate this hour to you as we study the words that you have given us and study how you organized the tabernacle in the beginning. Grant that we would see Christ in everything that we speak about, and send us your Spirit to open our hearts and minds to that word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as we uh, dive into chapter 39, which is the next to last chapter of the entire book of Exodus, boy, I just it's been such a nice journey. I can't believe it's about to come to an end. But uh, would you like to set the stage or perhaps catch people up or any background information you'd like to provide so that people know where we're at and where we're going? Sure. Uh, You guys have walked through this already in the earlier chapters of Exodus. Uh, In fact, this is a reflection of Exodus chapter 28 leading into 29 with the priestly vestments. But what's different between 28 and here in 39 is in 28, they would have said, this is how you're going to do it. And in 39, everything's kind of the same. 
except it says this is how they did it, uh, which is exactly according to the pattern set up by God to Moses. And then we have that short little bit on the end where uh, Moses blesses and checks everything over, which is kind of interesting in itself. But we get to go through the vestments again, and that's always a good thing. Well, it really is. And I just, I, as a person who really appreciates the symbolism and the beauty and the majesty that ornate vestments bring to the service, even in this day, I actually love looking back at this and just uh, imagining, because, you know, some of it's left to our imagination as we put together exactly what it looked like. We have lots of artist renditions out there. Otherwise, we only have what the text says, even though it is very mm -hmm. descriptive. But uh, I just love imagining, you know, just what this would have looked like. And not just because of its ornateness, but its ornateness in the midst of traveling through the desert, in the midst of basically a temporary mobile home for God. And then you still have so much attention to detail, not only for the tabernacle and the courtyard and the basin and the, and the, uh, the Ark of the Testimony and all that stuff, but even down to what the, the high priest wore. So, yeah, let's let's dig into that. Uh, we're sure. going to take it in stages, though. So I'm just going to read through verse 7. As you said, we've heard all of this before, although there are some additional details given, and I'm sure we'll, we'll illustrate those. But we're going to begin essentially with the ephod. And so this is going to be verses 1 through 7 from uh, the English Standard Version. From the blue and purple and scarlet yarns, they made finely woven garments for ministering in the holy place. They made the holy garments for Aaron, as Yahweh had commanded Moses. He made the ephod of gold, blue and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. And they hammered out gold leaf, and he cut it into threads to work into the blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and into the fine twined linen, in skilled design. They made for the ephod attaching shoulder pieces joined to it at its two edges, and the skillfully woven band on it was of one piece with it, and made like it of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and of fine twine linen, as Yahweh had commanded Moses. They made the onyx stones enclosed in settings of gold filigree, and engraved like the engravings of a signet, according to the names of the sons of Israel. And he set them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod to be stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel, as Yahweh had commanded Moses." Now, we won't get into the breast piece just yet. That's next. Mm -hmm. But just starting here with this ephod and these beautifully woven scarlet yarns, um, take us through this. You know, what, what can, what, what is, what's standing out to you that would be good for us to look at? Well, I certainly can't exhaust everything here. Uh, but uh, sure. earlier I didn't mention, it's probably important to mention that what we're dealing with here is a descriptive sort of passage in Scripture, not a prescriptive. So it's not telling us what to do, it's describing what happened. We can learn things from that, and we will, um, but we don't actually make these vestments in the church today. But we do have vestments. It kind of gives us in a mind of how God wants to organize things. And you got to notice, like you mentioned in the desert, how beautiful this is, uh, how stand standing out this would be. Everything that's in the tabernacle uh, is just incredibly uh, bright, uh, beautiful, uh, rich, uh, and very different than the day-to-day -day ex uh, experience of, of people living there, traveling through the desert, or even just living later in Jerusalem uh, or anywhere, really, in the world at the time. And so uh, you have these bright colors, and you can get into the meanings of the colors, and you always have to take that with a grain of salt. I mean, I can say stuff like, you know, this blue and purple is kind of like the sky, you know, that's heaven and eternity, the purple royalty, scarlet. We think of blood, of course, and the blood of Christ, all these kind of things. Y you could pull that in. We just have to be careful and say, well, you know, okay, uh, but what's going on here? So these garments uh, are for ministering in the holy place. So the garments, we are told what they are specifically to be used for is service. And service to God, really, not the community yet, though that's there, but service to minister in the holy place. We find out later at the end, if Aaron's not wearing the stuff he's supposed to wear and the other priests, uh, God could strike you dead. So there's a little danger in this service in the holy place. And so these vestments serve as a purpose to protect 
Uh, and when I look at Christ, you know, we are clothed in his righteousness. And so we too have garments given to all the priests, the priesthood of all believers, if you prefer that term, uh, that, that cover us and make us safe in the presence of the holy. The blood of Christ covers us. You can think of that with the scarlet. And it's all as the Lord has commanded Moses. So we get to this first uh, piece of clothing, this ephod, and it's probably a tunic. It's mentioned all over in Scripture. We're not always 100% sure exactly what it is, but it seems like a tunic. And uh, what's notable about it is that this blue, this purple, this scarlet, this is made of the same stuff that the curtain that separates the Holy of Holies from the, the regular holy place is made out of, which I think is kind of interesting because uh, that means that the high priest is a part of the furnishings of the tabernacle, or when he puts on his vestments, he's part of the furniture. And we say that today even about our pastors, that you throw the vestments on, you throw that stole on, or maybe the chasuble, which is kind of like that big poncho, it matches the colors on the altar, you become part of the furniture, part of the operating functions of the sanctuary. Uh, I could go on with some other details in here, but I don't give you a break to comment. <laughs> well, no, I mean, in fact, I'm really glad that you brought up two things especially. And and the first is all of the symbolism attached to the colors. It kind of reminds me of what we see done with the the different gifts that the, the, the Magi brought or uh, mm -hmm. all sorts of different things that we apply. Uh, I would say mnemonic. Uh, you know, things too, uh, ways that we can remember it. Sometimes we apply it for didactic reasons. That is, we want to teach people about the different aspects of Christ. And so, it, as you pointed out, it's not that it's necessarily bad. It's just it's not founded in Scripture. You know, we can't say that for sure. And so you connecting it to the the curtain is, I think, the most, the, the most poignant point that you can make, the whole idea of blending in with the furniture as we do today. In fact, in many congregations, the stoles that the pastor wears and uh, the, the uh, chasubles, if they have them, are often uh, not only owned by the congregation in terms of representing, you know, the pastor's authority coming from representing that congregation, but also they're of the exact same design as the ones on the altar. Uh, and on the and the pulpit and the lectern and so he as you said literally blends into the furniture and and that's important because what we do as pastors is to point to Christ not to ourselves now in this case though i would say that he, he, Aaron would have definitely stood out even amongst the other priests his sons uh, but again stood out for what to bring people's eyes toward God and what he was doing. And right now, as you said, he's just serving in the temple. Now, right. we do get some extra information here, though. We kind of get an insight into how this is made, where the thread he cut the threads to work into the blue and the purple and the scarlet yarns and then into the fine twine linen. And, and of course, he uses the gold leaf, which he hammers out. Uh, folks at home might be familiar with gold leaf you might find at a craft store. Uh, now, that's a very low-grade, very thin gold leaf that we might apply to something. Well, basically, it's kind of like that, except it's a little on the thicker side, a lot more high quality, where they basically really hammer it down as small as possible so that it can be worked and also, of course, to conserve the material. Uh, but we see for the first time them you know, weaving that all together. But what stood out to me is that um, you have a blending of fabrics here, which is otherwise forbidden. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 11, it says, You shall not wear cloths of wool and linen mixed together. And yet here we see such a mixture. Now, I think that what we're probably, uh, to, to reconcile this understanding, where we can go is we can say, well, perhaps this, blending of fabrics was forbidden for just casual, ordinary, vulgar, so to speak, use, but it was reserved for this sacred purpose. And and I think that's that also speaks to setting God's place and even his ministers apart in this time so that when, say, Aaron was out, you know, doing his errands, he's um, certainly not going to be wearing around the high priest outfit. Yeah, and you you meant you know it's this is what Aaron's going to wear, and he's going to stand out. But Aaron's not going to wear it forever. Aaron's going to die, 
and there's going to be another high priest and another high priest. And so they're all wearing the same thing. And so it, it's, it's the line of Aaron, yes, but it's not the man himself. It's that line and it's the vestments. And so again, it's, it doesn't matter in a sense who's wearing it. It's the, the, uh, that the vestments identify who is placed there uh, to minister in the tabernacle. Uh, because yeah, Aaron, Aaron will, will pass into history. But the, uh, but the role of the high priest will continue on, actually, into eternity, because that's Christ. And, uh, yeah, it was interesting you mentioned the gold leaf, that how they did it. So they, we just get a little, you know, explanation of it. And, and gold, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a metallurgist, but I know that gold can be spun very finely into thread. So it's just interesting to have a little insight into how they got about that process it's a really interesting material to use, very beautiful, non-corruptible material. So uh, it can be purified and then it doesn't tarnish. And so that's one of the reasons why gold is used all over it in the world, in the ancient world, why it's valuable. It has some of these unique properties. And as we're looking at these vestments, we're also looking at a reflection of what the heavenly uh, space would look like. And so this beauty, this incorruptibility of things is there and then you get these shoulder pieces just to move along in, in the text a little bit and they are and whenever it says skilled like in the esv translation skilled design skillfully woven it doesn't mean like you and i say well, we have skills it means like this is the top of the line stuff this is the best designer in the world putting their everything into it uh, so going into the tabernacle and i'm sure that you've talked about this before it's one there's beauty there's color and there is just this overflowing of skill like the best is going into this sometimes people will complain like well you know there's poor people out there there's other people out there why are we investing in the building of the church in the furnishings of the church and these kind of things um, we see a pattern here that the best is dedicated to this we also, uh, example that I usually give is, so all these folks are out in the desert, the most important thing that they're going to revolve around when they camp is that tabernacle, is God and God with them. It sets their standard for the day and for the week and for their years. And why should they be denied beauty? Where can poor people go to have access to some of the best music ever written some of the finest words written down in scripture and then to hear a sermon, to hear teaching on it for free, to hear uh, musicians play, to see beauty. Uh, why should we deny them that? Uh, they, they, as well as anyone else, deserves that. And so from the greatest king to the lowest person that you can imagine can come into the church, can come into the tabernacle and experience what only kings get to experience. Not all art museums are free for people to go into. And so this is a, this is a, a wonderful pattern for us as we think about how we organize our spaces and our worship to make sure that there is color there is beauty and there is skill that is put into everything we do, top to bottom. I think that's a great analogy. And piggybacking on that, I'd like to add one more thing. Not only do they get to experience those things within the church, uh, if it's set up in such a way, but it's also a reminder of the glory and the beauty and the wealth, so to speak, that they will inherit right? By mm -hmm. being members of God's kingdom, by being heirs and sons and daughters of the king. So yeah, earthly speaking, there are some places where only uh, the very wealthy and kings and those in power get to uh, experience. Uh, but here in the church, you know, people are reminded that God has chosen them as his own. You also yes. talked earlier when I mentioned uh, the high priest Aaron, that of course you know, the office is forever. It's fulfilled in Christ. He's our great high priest. But speaking of not the men or man themselves, but uh, but the the heritage, so to speak, we have in verse seven set in the shoulder pieces of the ephon the stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. So engraved in these, just like you would a signet ring, it says, are the names of the sons of Israel. But not to remember the sons, like the 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 people who the men themselves, but rather the generations that followed from them which, of mm -hmm. course, represent all those Old Testament believers. Yeah, and, and so when Aaron goes in, and we'll see this in the breastplate in a little bit, he is 
carrying Israel with him into the holy place. And so this starts with these shoulder pieces, these stones. And and the rem it's remembrance is an interesting thing. I think it was Dr. Norman Nagel in one of my classes that mentioned that remembrance a lot of times, the majority of times in the Bible is actually referring to God, not that he forgets, but that it's brought before him in a gracious manner, that he, that he remembers his grace towards us. And so this is the son's of Israel. And in the case of why on the shoulders, because the breastplate is going to lay on the chest, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but why on the shoulders? The best thing I can think of is if you think of the Lord as our shepherd, and you think of Jesus as the good shepherd, of course, he goes out, finds his lost lambs, places them on his shoulders, and carries them. And so we are carried into the presence of the holy by Christ. And that's maybe what the reason these stones are on the shoulders with the names of the sons of Israel are. I like it. Sounds good to me. Why don't we actually go ahead and add in some more uh, verses, and that's sure. going to be verses 8 through 21. And This is going to be the breast piece. He made the breast piece in skilled work in the style of the ephod of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. It was square. They made the breastpiece doubled, a span its length and a span its breadth when doubled. And they set in it four rows of stones. A row of sardius, topaz, and carbuncle was the first row. And the second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They were enclosed in settings of gold filigree. There were twelve stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They were like Cygnus, each engraved with its name for the twelve tribes. And they made on the breastpiece twisted chains like cords of pure gold. And they made two settings of gold filigree and two gold rings, and put the two rings on the two edges of the breastpiece. And they put the two cords of gold and the two rings at the edges of the breastpiece. They attached the two ends of the two cords to the two settings of filigree. Thus they attached it in front to the shoulder pieces of the ephod. Then they made two rings of gold and put them at the two ends of the breastpiece on its inside edge. Um, pardon me. Lost my spot. There we go. Inside edge next to the ephod. And they made two rings of gold and attached them in front to the lower part of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod at its seam above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And they bound the breastpiece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with lace of blue so that it should lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod, and that the breastpiece should not come loose from the ephod, as Yahweh had commanded Moses. All right, so we're talking about the breastpiece, and clearly the ephod also, right? This is a whole part of it. Uh, right. So take us through some of this. We have just a few minutes before our break, so take us through, get us started on, uh, on what we could take away here. Well, we have our skillful work again, so the best of the best. This is kind of a square piece that has a pocket in it. It holds the umanim and thumanim, if I say that right. Uh, the, uh, the ways that uh, sometimes Israel would discern God's will in things. It's not the focus of this text here, but that's why it's doubled over. Uh, and it has all the stones for the tribes of Israel. And the list of stones is interesting. We can talk about that maybe after the break because that, that can get pretty in-depth. Um, but it is, all these stones with Israel's names on it are placed over basically the chest and the heart of the high priest, so Aaron in this case. A reminder, just like Israel's on the shoulders, kind of like that lamb being carried on the shoulders, that here Israel is in the heart uh, of God, in the heart of Christ, as this is a picture of who our high priest is. And he always carries us above his heart. Uh, so that I think that's kind of cool and that's kind of important in how this is put together. And then, of course, you know, they have the, the cords of gold, the rings. This is all just holding it together and descriptions of how it's held together and how, how rich it is uh, and how it is uh, as the Lord had commanded Moses. So everything is being done exactly as God has said. They are being faithful to what God has revealed to them. That faithfulness to what he has revealed, I think, is the important reason why we see it repeated, you know, as mm -hmm. you pointed out, because they don't have a good track record for faithfulness, and they won't in the future. But it's it's so important here because we've already – and we talked about this yesterday, but even when it came time to give of what they had plundered from Egypt, 
uh, to make these things, they gave so much that Moses had to tell them to stop. And now they're giving of their skilled work, as you pointed out, that these craftsmen, um, uh, Bezalel and Holiab, these guys, they're the ones in charge, but there are other craftsmen too. Mm -hmm. um, they're giving of what the Lord has given them, and they're doing it according to the Lord's word. They're they're following his command, and I think that's a super important point to point out. Yeah, and I, it, I have that in my own congregation. We needed a new baptismal font, and so we called our skilled workers together in the congregation, and one of them stepped forward to make that new font. I, I always enjoy any congregation I go to where you have the handicraft work of people that are in the congregation. I mean, it's okay to order something from a magazine. I, that's fine. But, uh, but it's always nice when the people of God can contribute and put those things together as they do here. Precisely. And whenever you're able to contribute to your own worship space, it does give it a little bit more uh, a meaning. But you're absolutely right. You know, the things that you order in catalogs can also be very skilled, too. Uh, sure. But it also means something when you're able to add in the type of symbols that you want to communicate to the, the people, things that are important to you, important to the faith, and, and that sort of stuff, too. So, yeah, we well, have lots of, of – go ahead. Oh, I don't know how much time we got here, but uh, I could tell you a story about uh, these vestments that comes yeah. out of Josephus. If we got a minute or two, then we can yeah, get go stones ahead. afterwards. All right. So uh, Alexander the Great is, this is according to Josephus, is besieging Jerusalem. And he's mad the city is not given up. And he finally kind of takes it. And so their response to him is they send the high priest out in his full vestments. Um, and just the splendor of what we're describing here uh, impresses Alexander so much that his anger is quelled and he leaves the city alone. Um, so I just, it's kind of, you wow. know, the descriptions are nice and the pictures you can call up online are nice, but to, to see these things must have been so impressive, uh, so wonderful. Yeah, I, you know, it reminds me sort of of Herod's temple. We have all these different descriptions, and we have uh, artist renditions. Uh, but then you, when you hear people who actually saw it in person, and they say things mm -hmm. like, "To look at it was to look like directly into the sun. It shone for such beauty." Uh, you know, you have people like I think that actually is also from Josephus. But you have Josephus <laughs> who's communicating uh, the beauty it, through experience rather than necessarily description. And that's mm -hmm. an interesting story that I actually hadn't heard before. Um, I tell you what, Pastor, why don't we go ahead and take that break? Uh, yeah. We'll just be a few minutes, folks. Don't go anywhere, because when Pastor Fairman and I come back, we'll keep going with Exodus chapter 39. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend Ryan Fairman, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Wausau, Wisconsin. Folks, I'm so encouraged when you write in. If you have questions or comments about today's show or you just want to say hello, you can drop me a note at Pastor Boo, that's B-O-O-E, at gmail.com. You can also find me on Facebook and send me a message there. Thank you so much for listening and for telling others about Thy Strong Word. Now, Pastor, before the break, we were just talking about the breast piece or the breastplate mm -hmm. that goes with the ephod. 
Um, I think we might as well get some of the rest. We have three more things that are described. The robe of the ephod, the coats, which are woven of fine linen, linen and the turban, and then the uh, the plate of the holy crown, the ESV says. But I think that's going to need some unpacking. So I'm going to read verses 22 through 31. He also made the robe of the ephod woven all of blue, and the opening of the robe in it was like the opening in a garment, with a binding around the opening so that it might not tear. On the hem of the robe they made pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. They also made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates all around the hem of the robe, between the pomegranates, a bell, and a pomegranate, a bell, and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe for ministering as Yahweh had commanded Moses. They also made the coats woven of fine linen for Aaron and his sons, and the turban of fine linen, and the caps of fine linen, and the linen undergarments of fine twine linen, and the sash of fine twine linen, and of blue and purple and scarlet yarns, embroidered with needlework, as Yahweh had commanded Moses. And then they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold, and wrote on it an inscription, like the engraving of a signet, Holy to Yahweh. And they tied it to a cord of blue to fasten it on the turban above, as Yahweh had commanded Moses. All right, so we're not quite to the end of the chapter yet, but we're really to the end of all the construction or the creation of these pieces according to God's command. Uh, but we have now robes and linens and hats and and a diadem or crown uh, or, or a metal plate. Uh, yeah, that's, that's something we should unpack. But uh, starting at the top, uh, take us through it. Well, I'm going to take you back a little bit because I promised the listeners I talk about those stones. Oh, uh, you're right. Before. That's right. Go ahead. Uh, and lists of stones appear in Scripture, like in Job, talking about uh, 28, the wisdom of God is compared to all these precious stones. Ezekiel 27, the riches of a city, Tyre, is compared to that. Song of Songs has a list of stones that talk about the beauty of the beloved. And so the priest is decked out in a way that is... Uh, rich, and I say rich in the sense of cream, not in the sense of wealth, showing off wealth, but just this beautiful extravagance, and there's this sense of wisdom, there's a sense of beauty, but the best thing about the stones on the ephod is they show up one time later in scripture, and that is in Revelation uh, 21, and we find the stones as the base of the city of New Jerusalem. And so just as this ephod, uh, I mean, the breastplate on the ephod represents, you know, being before the heart of God and being brought before God, his holy city then is just built upon uh, the people of God in a sense that he builds from there in his love, and this is what he desired, and he lives among them just like he was among them with the tabernacle. So that's, that's pretty neat that this actually does show up again uh, right at the very end. Uh, so it's a hopeful sign for us when we see this and God's love for us. Yes. All right. Um, so <laughs> Absolutely. I, well, one thing about the stones, too, is sometimes we don't exactly know what all the stones exactly were. Uh, right. But, but the point being, of course, is just that they were precious stones, and that would have been significant. And that's varied by some people think things are precious in certain cultures and different cultures are different. So. Uh, that's true under, underneath that, he had the robe. It's blue again. You know, that, that kind of heavenly, eternal uh, thought. Even Luther's uh, symbol, Luther's rose, has this field of blue in the back. It's a heavenly thought. Uh, and so this garment is seamless. Uh, it's in one piece. And we see John hinting at something of that when Jesus is stripped uh, after he's beaten. And, and they have this seamless robe that he's wearing. There's a little uh, nod back to the fact that Jesus is our high priest uh, when, when he is stripped there. Uh, on our behalf, he's doing this. He moves from priest to lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, the hem of the robe has these pomegranates, and that's remarkable. We've seen it before in the tabernacle, but these are images of things in creation. The idolatry in the commandments has to do with idolatry at the end in the heart not necessarily in the fact that you can't have decorations in the worship space. So we today have stained glass windows. We might even have statues. 
we have images, symbols, and these kind of things um, drawn from creation to use. So the pomegranates are there. It's kind of a symbol for um, fruitfulness, liveliness. You have these bells that make a noise when the priest is moving around, and there's a practical sense of that because if he's struck dead, uh, there's supposed to be a cord around his leg. They pull him out so they can hear him moving in there, but there's also this kind of almost proclamatory uh outspeaking sense that when the high priest is doing his his work uh the bells are ringing out we still have bells in our churches that ring out and say hey the the work is going to be done the lord is going to be here he's going to serve you uh so there it's a nice little detail that they have on the hem of the robe and it does come up um in sort of in the story of uh, zechariah in the new testament where he meets the angel going into the holy place and he must be still because people are wondering is he okay did something happen and then they, then they hear him come out he comes back out he can't speak and that's a great story you can read in luke uh yeah i got that right uh yes. and so yep <laughs> and uh always at the end for ministry for service this is what these are for uh they're not for anything else they're not used for anything else we don't know what the code is this is fine linen coat. Uh, it's just something that is worn. What I suspect goes on here is you've got this hat, this turban, they call it, but in other places they call it a miter, whatever they want to call it. But there's this cap that goes underneath it. There's these undergarments that go underneath it. Uh, frankly, you know, you're in the middle of the desert. You're in a hot climate. You're going to sweat. You don't want to ruin these garments. And so you have a, a layer of protection. That's the little cap on the head before you big, put the big hat on. It might be comfort to but it also is just to keep, you know, from the garments being ruined. And it's also to cover cover the flesh. The angels, in uh, when they view God, the, the seraphim in Isaiah 6, they, they cover themselves in his presence. And so, too, uh, the high priest is basically completely covered uh, in the presence of God. Uh, there's that. And, and that's different than other religions and, and of that time. There, are, there were religions that people would minister naked. Uh, and all kinds of strange stuff. So this was this would make the high priest stand out. Uh, any comments before we get to the plate? Uh, no, no, no. I'm just I'm just listening. I love though that the there is practicality involved. I mean, if you're correct sure. in the sense of the undergarments are just that undergarments to protect the outer garments, which is pretty much the reason why we still wear them today. Um, mm -hmm. We yeah we. We, we see here that God is familiar with our our needs. Um, so it's not even just about protecting the garments, but he just he knows how his creation operates. And so he provides for that. But you're right. We also have this separation between our sinfulness and what God calls us to do. And so I can imagine even before we get to the diadem or whatever, I can just mm -hmm. imagine um, Aaron feeling so unworthy when he starts to don these high priest garments that he probably would be eager to not touch them necessarily. I, I remember when, uh, I think it was my first call, I, I needed some purificators made. And I had a wife of one of my elders who was a very faithful Roman Catholic. Uh, and she, in fact, she gave me a very good compliment one day. She says, oh, she'd come to hear me preach several times. And she said, oh, I really wish you were, were a Roman Catholic priest. So I'll take that as a compliment. Um, I, I wish she were Lutheran because she would have been a great one. Um, but the point is she had heard that we needed some purificators. And so she went and she made them. And she made the purificators. But then once she had been finished making them, she put them in a little brown bag, and then she refused to touch them from that point on because so, mm -hmm. she had sort of designated them for this holy use. And But it was her hand that made it, and I always thought that was very a very strange way to behave. Um, but then I can imagine that looking at this. You have all of these people's hands, and they're the ones who supplied the materials, but once they've contributed their goods and their skills and their effort and their time, and now – they haven't been consecrated for use yet, but still now they're put together for a special use. Once they're designated for this holy use, then I, I do. I think the opinion toward them changes. Um, we, we, we genuflect or bow at the altar in recognition of what Christ does. He comes to us through the, through the sacrament there, but the altar, you know, may have been made by 
you know, Jim Bob out, out, you know, that lives just right outside of town, or we might know, you know, so-and-so's granddad put this together or, or the pulpit, you know, and other things, you know, you're going through this now, but that doesn't make it less holy just because we happen to know who made it. It's not, you know, made by monks in the, in the Alps or something, but at the same time, once it's set apart for holy use, then we respect that how God uses those things. So I imagine there's a lot of that going on here too. Yeah, and some of the workmen would never see their work again because uh, it goes oh, inside right. uh, the temple or the tabernacle. And uh, an example of that in modern day I find interesting is the, the founder of Apple. What's his name? I can't remember what his name is. I always wore his black turtlenecks. He oh, that would be was, Steve Jobs. I was going to say Steve Wozniak, Jobs. but go ahead. Yeah, uh, he... Uh, he was raised in a Lutheran household to some extent. So I like to think there's an influence there, even though he left the faith uh, later in life. But he always would sign his work on the inside. He would always design the inside of the machines to be just as beautiful as the outside. He'd, that's what his stated goal was. He'd never see it. No one would ever see it. But that's what he'd do. And in the same way, too, many of the things that we you know, dedicate to God or to use, and here especially in the tabernacle, you, you won't see again, but that's not the point. There's wonderful carvings in some of the cathedrals in Europe where the uh, no one would ever see what they carved. In fact, now we can go climb up high or send a drone up to look over something. Like and you see these things and you're like, nobody's ever looked at them for like a few hundred years. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's this that is given to God. Here it's the pattern he gives, but also it's just that they're dedicating the work to God. And that's, that's what's good and, and wholesome and holy about it. Well, let's, let's talk about that plate. Yeah. Or whatever they want to call it. I mean, like the Hebrew is kind of, it's like a, a shining thing, a flower or something like that. We're, we're just not really sure exactly what that is. It goes over the hat, though. And the important part is it says, holy to the Lord. And when you go back to chapter 28, it kind of describes a little bit more of what's going on. That uh, as Aaron carries the sins of the people, that that plate there is a reminder to God uh, that at the, not to strike Aaron dead basically. And, and this all ties up into Christ and how he carries our sins to the cross and he is rejected and, and yet he is the Holy One. Uh, and so there, that all these pictures, as you mentioned before, this picture language is training Israel as children who have been sitting in a, a, a polytheistic, you know, pagan, whatever word you want to use, uh, religious space for many years, what God is going to do, who God is. And it takes it takes a while for them to pick it up. In my church, uh, the, the, the colors, the images, you know, I, I try to teach the small children about, but sometimes there's just living it that's healthy for them, uh, that they, they're, they're surrounded by the symbolism. So that I always tell people that the best place to have a funeral is in church because all those symbols, all those colors, they've, they've lived their whole lives around this. And it tells us something about Christ. It tells us something about the God we worship. And it's a lively, life-giving, holy place. And that, that extend, expresses our hope, both to the youngest, to the oldest, and to our guests. And, that, and that's what's really happening here. But, the, but that plate is, is, is so that Aaron doesn't get struck down for carrying the sins of the people as he brings the blood in. Uh, to atone for for the sins of Israel. Why don't we add the rest of our chapter to the discussion? Sure. This is going to be verses 32 through 43. Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished, and the people of Israel did according to all that Yahweh had commanded Moses, so they did. Then they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent, and all its utensils, its hooks, its frames, its bars, its pillars, and its bases, the covering of tanned ram skins and goat skins, and the veil of the screen, the ark of the testimony with its poles and the mercy seat, the table with all its utensils and the bread of the presence, the lampstand of pure gold and its lamps with the lamps set and all its utensils and the oil for the light, the golden altar, the anointing oil, the fragrant incense, the screen for the entrance of the tent, the bronze altar and its grating of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the basin and its stand, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its bases, and the screen for the gate of the court, its cords, its pegs, and all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle, for the tent of meeting. 
the finely worked garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons for their service as priests. According to all that Yahweh had commanded Moses, so the people of Israel had done all the work. And Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it. As Yahweh had commanded, so they had done it. Then Moses blessed them. All right, so it wraps it up by basically saying they did everything, but what's important, I imagine, is that they did everything just as God had commanded, and Moses signs off on it saying, yep, you sure did, and he blesses them. Uh, what a nice way to end this section. Yes, and uh, that phrase of doing according to all the Lord had commands like nine times in this chapter. So, you know, there might be like, pay attention to this, that I— for us too, you know, we we are given the word, uh, and the will of God is expressed in that. The neat thing I think here is when you look at all these things they made, and it's according to God's pattern, but they all derive out of the people. It is all out of their work. It is all out of their skill. It is all out of their pocket, if you could say that. And God is going to use that to, uh, in the end, bless them to forgive their sins. And what that reminds me of is reminds me exactly of Christ coming in our flesh, arriving out of the people, out of the people of Israel, and the Son of God being in flesh, incarnate, is going to then use that flesh to save us, uh, true God and true man. And to this very day, you know, we bring our gifts and things here, but at the end, the bread, the wine that's brought forward, that's used, here God turns around and uses those items, the water in baptism, to bless us. Very physical, very earthy things. I mean, he made it all. He created creation. He likes it. And here he uses it in blessing. And then Moses at the end here uh, surveys all of it, approves all of it. Moses is the one that saw this stuff you know, initially in, in the vision of heaven. And so it's, yep, that's, yep, yep, that's the way it is. Yep, that's how I remember it. Yep, that's how God said it was to be. And then uh, when it says he blessed them, as far as I can tell, he's actually blessing the people, uh, I think. I, I Maybe you have a different different take on that, but I, I think he blessed the people <laughs> at that point. Well, I uh, think it it's funny that, that you... Blessed the work. Well, I think I, say, I think it's funny that you bring that up because until you said... Well, he blessed the people. I just assumed it was the people. It never occurred to me that it would have been the uh, articles that were created or the work. Um, and so I'm looking at that with that idea now, even though you're saying you don't think that's it. And I don't either. I, I guess it seems like the most natural reading is that he's blessing the people who had yeah. done it. I mean, because there's there a will sense be that a time we consecrate stuff. Yeah. yeah, we consecrate stuff. And even in the New Testament, you go like into uh, what Timothy and, and it talks about uh, with the Word of God in prayer, we set things apart in creation. And there's a place to do that. And they do have a big ceremony uh, coming up where they're going to do that. Yeah, but yeah he, blesses, he blesses the people. And, and so out of their giving and gifts, the blessing comes to them. And so, uh, you know, Christ comes in the flesh for us, and thus we are blessed. Uh, so that, I think that's how that uh, picture is supposed to come to fruition and, and for us to interpret as we look back with Christ at the center of everything that we read here in these Old Testament accounts. Of course, we need to keep Christ at the center of it, but I also can't help but think of a, a couple of things as we look at all of the intricate detail with which God had revealed these things to Moses that Moses then communicated to the people then God, of course, gives uh, Aholiab and Bezalel. He gives them his spirit. They, they have the gifts from God to put these things together. There's really no indication that Moses is supervising this. He just trusts in the Lord's work, and they do it. And then it's just amazing that it does come out, that there isn't like a telephone game. We don't have any indication that Moses was like, well, you know, the horns of the altar didn't exactly look like that. Um, no, it just, it was done. The people did it according to God's will. And I think that is in grand contrast when we often remember these people for their lifting up of the, of the idol in 
uh, you know, as, as Moses is taking too long and oh, this, this is Yahweh who brought you out of Egypt. They're trying to worship God according to their own desires. Uh, but mm -hmm. here they're following his will. And I don't think they kind of get the credit they deserve for that. And likewise, because of the intricate details, I, I just think it's beautiful that when he's listing off all the things that were created, he mentions the utensils. He mentions the pegs, you know, the pegs, not yep. just, yeah, but not just to communicate that they were done right. But I also think to remind us that, you know, when we think of how we contribute, you know, we are now, of course, the temple of God. God dwells in us. We're the church. We're the, that's a assembly of people around word and sacrament. And so you think, well, what part am I? And if, if this were the list, then, you know, it's unlikely that we're the, we're the, 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 the veil or we're the, the mercy seat or we're the, the bronze basin even. You know, we're all probably little pegs in God's church in terms of our abilities. And yet God remembers those, even the little details. He's at work in all of them. Yeah, I could see this little guy that's like an underworker that made some of the pegs. And Moses is like, you know, that's a fine looking peg you made there. Uh, so it's all the pieces... <laughs> Are there exactly? And that's important. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You that peg is exactly right. I mean, he probably yeah. thinking nobody's going to care about a peg, but he does it to the best of his ability. And and if it weren't for the peg, then things would not come together. And that reminds us that God is, he's very interested in all things. Uh, and so from and giving this pattern to Moses from the highest work, but even to the lowest work. And so in our day to day lives, as you mentioned, maybe we we fill the role of a peg. But uh, God is interested in what you're doing and your day-to-day -day life. And it might be a humble profession. Or as Luther once said, you know, God is pleased when a mother changes a baby's diaper. Those kind of things. This is all important in the sight of the Lord. Now, I, I do wonder, though, if any of them wanted to say, well, now be sure to put on that uh, utensil that it was donated by Grandma Schlitzendinger. <laughs> um, well, I once... you know... <laughs> <laughs> I once was uh, about to, I was visiting a congregation as a circuit visitor and I was serving um, because someone uh, couldn't make it. And I went to do the sacrament and on the lid of the communion ware of the individual cups, it had in memory of and the person who had donated it. And I just thought of all the worst places you know, I'm not for attaching any of the little stickers or the plaques to things in general for lots of reasons, uh, but this was the worst place that you could put it because obviously that's in remembrance of Christ. But uh, yeah, so we see here that they give, but then they get, I, I love how you just pointed out that there are some workers who they'll never see their work again and, and nobody else will see their work either except for the high priest. Mm -hmm. High priest and God. Uh, we have a tradition in our congregation, it's long before me, of not actually putting stuff on things. So there, that stops at some point historically. But archaeologically, uh, some of our earliest examples of Christian arts and mosaics and stuff like that inevitably say, and we're talking, you know, maybe like the third century, donated by so-and-so oh, wow. or by so-and-so's family. It's always been around. It's just a thing, you know. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Well, brother, I uh, really have enjoyed having you on the episode. Uh, any kind of take-home comments before for people to take home with them, I mean, before we wrap it up? I think we should, I, I'm very big into, you know, we should make our worship spaces uh, beautiful. I think there's value in that, uh, especially in a world that it seems now more and more ugliness is upheld. And so there's, it's okay to do that, and it's okay to worship in the beauty of holiness of course if you're in a church in a a place that you it's built out of you know cardboard and steel and that's all you got that's a holy place too because of the presence of the lord but we should bring what we can always uh to that worship to use in that spot it really does confess how we feel about god and what goes on in that space we see this here in the old testament and you will all see it uh, believers in Christ will see it when you are in the heavenly holy place and the beauty will be beyond what we can even imagine with these earthly goods. Well said, brother. I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Ryan Fairman, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Wausau, Wisconsin. Pastor, thanks for being on the show again. Thank you. It's always uh, great to share the word with you. 
Folks at home, tune in tomorrow. It all comes together in chapter 40 when God calls Moses to set up everything that has been crafted for the tabernacle. And then on Friday, we begin a new series on the only two books in the Bible named for women, the book of Ruth, followed by Esther. So don't miss that. Until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.